Okay, our lesson this morning is building faith. And if you build anything, you've got to have something to put it on. Uh, I could tell you war stories about the foundation of my house and Scott would just laugh at me. To make it short, it's built on clay. And when clay gets wet, it expands and it's ball clay and that's 10%. When it dries out, it contracts 10%. Well, now that just in your mind ought to tell you that there's something going to happen there. Well, my house is 90 feet long, and 10% of 90 feet is 9 feet that it's got to move. Well, I, my house wiggles now. I anchored it. I anchored it on bedrock. It's 35 feet deep, one corner of my house is, and it just kind of rotates. It's, uh, it's weird, and I, every so often I have to have people to come put it back on the foundation because it'll walk itself right off. It, and doors won't open and shut and the walls crack and the ceiling cracks and it's awful. Okay, so I laid that story to you so that you can understand what you build on is important. Christianity is a spiritual journey. It's con uh, described in the scriptures as a walk. You walk with God, John. We've been studying on Wednesday night, 1 John chapter 1, walk in the light. Um, and Jesus went and he uh, called the disciples one by one, come follow me, he said. And they got up, and uh, Matthew specifically, and, and did. It is a religion that is learned it's not something you say, I'm a Christian, flip, flip the light switch on, and everything's cool and fine. It's not. You don't stop the bad habits all at once. You don't start doing the right things all at once. And so as you learn, as you learn from what the scripture says that God wants you to do, and when you learn from what your experience is between in fellowship with other Christians, and then you learn and expect what God or how God is going to treat you, your whole life is different. And I want you in, to begin right now thinking about a long time ago and the spiritual differences that there are in you now and what there were. This is going to come out, I hope, in the rest of this lesson. It's a continual thing, y'all. As long as you live, you will never stop needing to grow. You will never get to the place when you can say, I've got it made. That's it. No. And there's a reason for that we'll get to in a minute. So I want to ask the question, are we building our faith? And I think on your outline, it probably is worded really weird. Are we, are we, or something like that. I don't remember, but I had to change it here and then on here, and I'd already run off the outline. Are we building our faith? And by that I mean, are we doing it on purpose? What is, what is the one thing that you can think of that you've done this past week that would strengthen and encourage your faith? What is the one thing that you've done to, I want to grow my faith. And if you as a Christian were asked, I think every one of you would say, I do want my faith to be stronger. I want to be more faithful. I want to be closer to God. Every one of you, I think, would say that. But it needs to be a desired end. And that desired end, again, Scott, as we studied on Wednesday night, is to look like Jesus. 1 John chapter 3 says, we'll see him as he is, for we shall be like him. Well, this life, this Christian life that we're doing right now is trying to get us to align ourselves up and to change ourselves so that we do look like Jesus. Well, Christ is the only foundation. You want bedrock? That's it. You're building on the bedrock when you build on him. And it's found in Matthew chapter 7, 
verses 24 through 27. And the image there is building a house. It's the foolish man and the wise man. You know, that makes a really good vacation Bible school lesson. It makes a really good children's song, you know. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the foolish man built his house upon the sand, and it came down smashing, but the wise man's house built on the rock, it stood firm. And we get those kids excited with those actions that they did. But that is not a standalone story. And when we teach the wise man foolish man and we only allude to Jesus being the rock, that's not it. That's not the point. It comes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. You know, every week I have a thing up there that says closure on it. That parable, that teaching about the building of the house is the closure to that sermon. You gotta know what's in it. And I sure wish I had about four days to teach y'all what's in that, that sermon. But you know it begins with the Beatitudes, and it talks about letting your light so shine. It talks about some morality issues of divorce and remarriage and fornication and those kinds of things. Then it talks about helping people, and if somebody compels you to go a mile, go with him too. And on and on Jesus went. Here's how you live as a Christian. Jesus is telling them, you be careful what you build your faith on. It's how you appear before him. He is the rock. He is the strength. He is the foundation. And if you have your foundation on a church, it's not going to stand. If you have your foundation upon an elder, a deacon, a preacher, or whatever, it's not going to stand. It has to be upon Jesus. So let's see how important that is. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 20 and 22. I should have said verse 19. Because number verse 19 is where you find the you are no more. You're now in the house of God. You're now joined together with the saints. And then he says this. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. When it says the prophets and the apostles... Don't think that Paul is talking about building on those men. He's talking about building upon what those men taught. And they taught about Jesus. In the foundation, everything points to the cornerstone. I'm told that the most, the thing that's spent the most time on before a building is built in those days is the cornerstone. It has to be perfectly square. I went outside uh, at the high school uh, when I was teaching art, for you young kids back there, and I was going to build a kiln. Now, I never did get the kiln built, but I did get the foundation laid, and I did get it square. It took me three days to get that square. Scott, I'm not very good. Now, there's other reasons why I didn't get the kiln built. It wasn't just that I couldn't do it. I could do it, but I didn't do it. But be getting it square. If you don't have the cornerstone right, your building is not going to be right. And you can go into some of the older homes when they didn't really particularly care whether it was really square or not, and the thing would go like that. Or the walls would go in and out and all kinds of ways. And you just try to remodel one of those. And Scott can tell you, I imagine, that that is an impossible job because the foundation's not right. And the building is not right. And if I come to you and I try to build a church upon uh, activities, it's wrong. 
If I try to build it up on entertainment, it's wrong. Only upon Jesus Christ. He is the only one who has the authority because he's the one who shed his blood. He's the one that hung upon the cross for me. He's the one that I will go to. He is the only one. That's a huge verse right there. He goes on, and since you're built upon Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. When the building is done right, it will grow into a holy temple. And when it is built wrong, it will be an entertainment center. And when it is built wrong, it will have all the world to come into it because they don't care anything about Jesus. They care about having fun. They care about doing all kinds of things. Now, I'm not going to say, stand, sit here and tell you that having fun with the fellowship of the church is wrong. It is not. In fact, if you look on your bulletin, the Eastwood Church tonight is having their worship service at Eiffel Tower Park, and they're inviting everybody to come. At 4 o'clock, it's fellowship. At 5 o'clock, they're going to serve hamburgers. And at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a worship service. Bring a lawn chair and come and worship with them. There is nothing wrong with that. But I'll guarantee you, knowing the Eastwood Church like I know the Eastwood Church, when you go out there, it's not going to be just hamburgers. You're going to eat. You're going to have a good time. But then you're going to settle down. and You're going to honor our Lord. It will grow into a holy temple. And there is no option here. I want you to see this. If it is fitly framed together, it will be a holy temple in the Lord. And when I don't allow my body to be a holy temple, then I've got something wrong in it. In whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. When you set the cornerstone right, get the foundation right, you're going to become a temple for God and he's going to come and live in you. That's where we grow, people. That's what we get is a spiritual house. A spiritual house. There's a couple of songs that refer to this thought. One is, I want to stay here. Uh, uh, I don't want to stay here any longer. Yeah. I want to walk with the Lord. Uh, I have a home over yonder. And there are songs, you know, that, that speak about this. But when you become a spiritual house, there are things that happen. You need to understand you are like what you hang around. Let me illustrate it like this. You take a glass of pure water and a glass of muddy water, and as long as they are separated, they stay that way. You take the pure water and pour it into the muddy water, and the muddy water just becomes a little less muddy. You take the muddy water and you pour it into the clear, pure water, and the pure water is no longer pure. You are what you hang around. It is true Jesus went and ate with the sinners. Yes. And he prayed, I don't want you, to, Father, to take them out of the world. But he, what he does want is that the world will see in us the light shining from God. And the company we keep is so important that we don't go like them, but that they come like us. Do you remember what Paul said to King Agrippa? Almost you persuade me to be a Christian, Paul. I wish you were. All together, like as unto myself, except for these bonds. It is mission work. And that's what we're all about. To do that is a transformed life. 
comes from Romans chapter 12. Be ye transformed in your mind, renewed in your mind. Don't be like the world. And it submits to God. Sometimes I just want my way. And sometimes I let it be known I want my way. But when it comes to my spiritual life, I don't have a way. And I hear people all the time say, I can't go to church there because I don't like it. You want your way? I can't go to church there because they whatever. Every single one of us are human beings and every single one of us have faults and every single one of us make mistakes and every single one of us do not do our religion perfectly and I need to accept that and so do you. But my company needs to be with God who has come to live with me. And when I am influenced, it needs to be by him and I need always to be improving. James says in James chapter 4 verses 6 through 10. But he gives more grace. Therefore it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The relationship is seen all through that. God has come. He lives with me. He is in me. He surrounds me. And when I submit myself to him, humility, humbly, he receives me. But when I say I want my way, he resists me. And when he resists me, Satan comes. And when Satan comes, if I don't tell him to leave me alone, guess what? I fall. But if I draw near to God, since I am his temple, I am his home, he will come near to me. So let's see what that spiritual life looks like that's built upon the foundation of Jesus. First off, it's a life of prayer and communion with God. Now, in Philippians chapter 4, he talks about there that you offer thanksgiving and praise. And when you do, God is going to give you the peace that passes all understanding. In Psalms 42, he talks about thirsting for God. And I don't think we thirst enough for him so that he will come and make himself known to us. Back in uh, the 1970s, I believe it was, there was an educational push, the Madeline Hunter series. And it, it, was, it was a pretty good model for teaching. And one of the things that I remember Madeline Hunter telling us was that you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. But you can salt his oats, and then he'll drink. And she was talking about, you can't make all kids learn, but you can get them interested in some way, and then they'll learn. You can touch their lives. I thirst for God. Do you thirst for him? It is a sign of growth. When you can say, I want more of him. It's a sign of spiritual maturity. When you can say, I feel him with me. I know he is in me like he promised to be. And it's a life of obedience to God's word. I had a woman at one time tell me, I don't want to do X, Y, Z over here because... I've never been taught it. And I told her, well, it was in her Bible. She says, I don't know what the Bible says, but I know what I've been taught. 
And I said, well, you ought to want to learn what the Bible says. She says, well, I do, but I want to be taught it. I said, would you let me teach you? She said, no. <laughs> so here's, here's my point in this. When we find that we are in wrong, whatever it is, whether it's in our worship service, in our becoming a Christian, in living a Christian life, in coming back to God, whatever it is that we find we're wrong, Lord, forgive me. It's the only response that is appropriate for a Christian. Lord, forgive me. And let us bow in obedience to him. It is a life of love and service to others. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. Paul was talking about the, uh, the law. And about being in grace and, and that kind of thing. And he says what you need to do is. You need to serve one another humbly by love. And that's what we're here for. <clears throat> That's our reason for existing in the world is to be of service to the world and bringing them to the Lord. There is no other reason. God could just take us out, take us on home, and it'd be over. But he chooses not to. And when you're still left here, you need to know that there is a reason for it. There is something God wants you to do because when he's through with you, Psalm says you're going home. When God's through with you, Psalm says you're going on. It is a life of hope and perseverance. And I have Hebrews 11, 1 there. That whole chapter of Hebrews is, is uh, the example of hope and perseverance. It is a life that, God, I'm going to go through whatever I need to. God, you're the most important one. You are the one that I, I, I can come to. You're the only one I can have hope in. I know that. And even when I hurt, God, I still got to keep going. Yesterday I talked to two people. Dale was one of them that you know, the other one you don't know. And they were both hurting. Dale was, I don't, I don't know if I can make it or not. That kind of hurt. His pain was extreme. The other one was, this just hurts me so bad. I don't know how I'm going to get over it. Well, with both kinds of hurt, and both of them are real, and both of them need to be dealt with, you take it to the Lord. Because he's the only one that can carry you through. You take it to the Lord. And if my life looks, I want you to look at these, these four things. This is not an exhaustive list, but it gives you a hint at least. Here's the life that I need to live to be pleasing unto God. Here's the life that I need to grow in. And all of us need that. Every one of us. So let's bring it together. I want you to know it's difficult for me to sit here in the presence of you and tell you about growth. Because there are many of you that I feel like are more spiritual than I am. And there are many of you that I feel like are closer to God than I am. And there are many of you that I've, I need to take lessons from. And I hope that you, out of humility, can see that you, you do need to grow. Every one of us do. But here's the comfort in it. You are God's child. I have two children. I don't care what they do. I'm not going to throw them away. I may be disgusted with them. 
I may punish them. I may do a whole lot of things, but they still carry my name. They still carry my blood. And guess what? You carry God's blood. You say, are you teaching that you can, you can never be lost? No, I'm not teaching that. Because God in his sorrow and his love will tell me to leave if I leave him. But it will be that I have to leave him. He will never leave me. All of you out here have a close walk with God. You know what it means to be in his presence and you know what it means to have his love on you. And you know how bad it would be if that weren't there. I want it closer, don't you? And all of you have grown in spirit and in truth. I told you at the beginning that I wanted you to start looking back in your life about these things. And if I look back in my life 25, 30, 40 years ago, man, I was nothing spiritually. I'm still not much. But I certainly am a whole lot better now than I was then. If I look back even one year ago, I am number one more satisfied with my relationship with God than I've ever been in my life. And I hope you are. I am number two, more in control of my emotions and my faculties than I've ever been in my life. I am number three, wanting more to be with God in heaven than I've ever been before. It is a growth in spirit, and it is a growth in the truth of his love and mercy. So no matter where we are on a scale, if you want to put it on a scale, if we pay attention to growing with God, we will gain power spiritually and over Jesus. But don't ever forget, Jesus is our foundation. And therefore, everything we do must point toward him. I cannot go against his will. I cannot go against his wishes for me. And I cannot leave him out of anything I do. I went to see Dale this week. And I said, Lord, be with me. He was. Got there. Do you know how big Vanderbilt University Hospital is? 14 buildings. Lord, Take me where I need to go. First person I asked was, can you tell me where room 87, whatever it was, is? Oh, yes. Go through those doors and up the elevator and you'll see it on the right. Out of 14 buildings or whatever there is there, I mean, it's huge. I go exactly to the right place by asking God to lead me. Lord, help me say the right things. And we had a prayer in there in front of an orderly and in front of his roommate and a nurse. All of them said different things after the prayer was over. But all of them said we feel God is here. It needs to be. We need to always look for him. And I said, Lord, help us get back to Paris. He did. He did. I'm not going to tell you about I almost turned over. I'm not going to tell you about a car almost hit me broadside. I'm not going to tell you about a whole lot of other instances that happened. Guess what? None of it happened. He was with me. He is our foundation. And so, Lord, I give my life to you. I give it to you because I can't do anything else with it. We offer our praise and thanksgiving to him. Do you think I thank God when I got home? Yes. Last night we went to get a little bite to eat. We got back home. Thank you, God, for getting us home. 
And so a vow in submission. Before him as my king. To let him direct my life. And guess what? I look forward to being with him eternally. Don't you? And the only way we're going to get there is for us to continue the walk with God and continue the growth in spirit. Amen?